what is a business without sales? Basically, it's just a hobby. So how do we get sales? How do we find clients? How do we get over the anxiety of asking for a sale? I am not Alan Donegan. I am Jamie Dillon. And today I'm turning the tables on Alan. I'm going to grill him on all things sales and marketing. The extraordinary belongs to those that create it. Rebelling against business plans and debt, rebelling against what society expects of us to build cool businesses, make money, have fun and do good. Let's create something extraordinary together. Welcome to The Rebel Entrepreneur. Hey, Alan. Nice to see you again and speak to you again. It's nice to see you, Jamie. And yes, I'm glad to be back on my own show. Yeah, I'm very excited. (laughs) I mean, essentially, like I did spend like 13 weeks with you talking about sales and somehow I still have more questions to ask you about sales. So that's cool. It's actually a really big subject and it's one of the things that people find the hardest when launching a business. And I think the cause of that is the cultural societal meaning of what sales is. Because if you say the word salesman to people, they will play the word association game and say back to you, sleazy, slimy, used car salesman. They have plenty of words for salesman. And I specifically choose the word salesman as opposed to saleswoman Mm -hmm. because it gets a bigger reaction from the audience. And people have a really negative view of what sales is. So when you then sell people, if you want to start your business, go sell, they get a bit scared. Yeah. It's so funny. Like I, I've got that, like that pang of like, Ooh, anxiety sales, you know? And when I was doing my Kickstarter, that was a big thing. Every morning, I remember at one point I was contacting all of my contacts one by one, everyone who's following me, people, just every single one and and not necessarily selling to them, but beginning the process of selling and, and reaching out. And, Oh, I did it at the beginning of the day because I found it so hard. So I just wanted to get it over with. And I also feel like selling and sales, it seems like this big amorphous idea, this blob, like sales. Like what the fuck does that really mean? Like there's so many businesses, there's so many markets and, and people like, what the heck is sales? Like, what is it? I have two simple definitions that define it for me. And the first is sales is uncovering someone with a problem, selling them something that fixes their problem and charging them for it. So basically, the sales is the process of finding someone with a problem and making their life better. And that has helped me to get more comfortable with selling because I go around selling going, oh, I think you've got the problem. Let me check. I'll ask you some questions. I'll define the problem. And if you have, then I'll try and sell you what I've got, which is basically just telling you about it and asking you for the money. And the second definition, which is one that really helped me, is sales is the transfer of enthusiasm from one person to another. Ooh, I like that. So if I get enthusiastic about my product, if I get passionate about it, that's the quickest way to get you to feel it. And if you're suddenly enthusiastic about what I do, and I am, and we're both getting enthusiastic together, soon enough, you go, oh, this, like, I'm enthusiastic. I want to buy. And as long as I then do the sales bits of, like, some closing questions and stuff like that, like, enthusiasm is the root of all of it. I love this because we did talk about that in my Kickstarter uh, of selling my art, right? And you had even mentioned at one point, like, oh, what if you had a friend take over your Instagram and sell for you? And yeah, that's true because I can like shout out my friends day and night. But when it comes to shouting out my own art, it's really quite difficult. And even just uh, the other point too of, yeah, if someone has a problem, if you can really view selling as solving someone's problem becomes a very positive reframing of what sales is. You're not trying to be a shyster. You're not trying to get someone something they don't need. They want it. And you're trying to help them out by giving it to them, you know, for a price, obviously. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And I think the challenge that always comes back to me when I say this is, well, it's obvious what you sell fixes a problem, Alan, because you sell rebel business schools and that helps people start businesses, make their own money. Like it's a very clear problem you're fixing. I sell art. What problem do I fix? Like, well, that's seeing the word problem as a very binary, like it's a physical problem or a tangible problem. Boredom is a global epidemic problem that people are trying to solve through Netflix and Disney Plus and books and 
comedy and entertainment like is a global problem. And I think if you see it slightly broader as a problem of like, how do I have a beautiful living space? The problem is my living space is dull and I want to brighten it. The problem is like, I'm just not entertained at the weekend. I need something more entertainment. And I think seeing it as a broader thing, like, we all have problems. Maybe it's not the word problem. Maybe actually riffing with you right now, it's the word discomfort. Actually, if you can find someone who's not quite comfortable and you can help alleviate their discomfort, they're bored, they're unhappy, overweight, not earning enough, whatever it is, they've got problems. If you can alleviate that, then you can charge for it. Yeah. And I mean, if we can even find what art solves, which is like, to me, when I started my journey, was like, what problem does art solve? Uh, <laughs> nothing, you know? Yeah. Boredom, exactly. <laughs> entertainment. So if you can find that for art, surely everyone out there who has a non-art business can absolutely find this discomfort or this problem that their product or their service can solve. So I think that's a great starting place for what is sales. Yes. And it's even with art, it's inspiration. So if you're in a beautifully decorated house, if you're in a space that has incredible art, you just feel inspired mm -hmm. and happy and engaged. And I'll tell you what, environment has such a big impact on people's lives. You don't realize it until you do something about it, but it has a big impact. And that's part of sales is sometimes people don't know like exactly what their problem is and you have to help them uncover it. And the way you do that is by questions. So if I was going to ask a series of questions about the art side, it would be like, when do you feel inspired? What do you like to be around? What gives you energy? What lifts you up? And then it's quite interesting. People will give answers like, oh, I go to a certain space or I go to a certain place. And you can say, well, what is it about that space? What does it have? What gives you energy? You can uncover all sorts of things that will help you connect with people. And yeah, I think sales is about understanding the other person first. And one of the things I've uncovered, Jamie, and everyone listening to this, I do this exercise on pop-up business school. I'm going to blow it. I shouldn't blow it, but I'll tell you the answer. <laughs> if you want to know what the exercise, like come to the events, <laughs> but the message is I tell people to sell me something. And when I tell people to sell me something, what's the first thing you think they do, Jamie? They try and sell you something you don't need. Yeah. They just talk at me the item is this and it's this yeah. quality and it's this style and they're selling at me. And I'd say to them, sales is not selling. Sales is asking. To start with, you've got to understand the pers other person. But I think we have this notion and this image in Western society that sales is the gift of the gab, golden tongued salesman that will use as many words as he or she needs to get you to give in and buy their product. And ethical sales isn't about that. Ethical sales is about understanding the other person and whether they've actually got the problem you fix. I love that. I mean, it's great that you just called it ethical sales, but also uh, that's it. Like nobody is ever going to fall for this like car salesman type of sales ever again. Like everyone's really wise to this. And I just don't think that I see, I see you making faces. Sa yeah. I mean, sadly, like everyone is not wise to this. There are lots I of. I fall for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly there's people buying lots of stuff they don't need all the time. Their internet ads make money for a reason. Like, yeah. So I like that ethical sales. I enjoy this a lot. So okay, then I have a question for you because yes, I love this. When you find your client, you find your ideal client. You start asking them questions. You get to know them. You build relationships. That's beautiful. But where the heck are they? Where are these clients? Where do we find them? <laughs> <laughs> which is one of those key things is how do you find these people to work with? And this comes down to this kind of niche marketing or niche. If you're American, um, I don't know where the T comes from, but niche marketing or niche marketing is the process of finding a small market to be able to go for. And it's a type of person, type of business, type of organization that you will target. Nearly every entrepreneur I ever speak to resists me on niche marketing. They go, Alan, what do you mean I have to niche market? Doesn't that mean I'm selling less? And actually the interesting bit is by choosing a smaller market, you normally end up selling more, which is the exact opposite of what you would expect in life. So you choose a niche market and then people go, well, how do I choose a niche market, Alan? This is very confusing. And I go, well, 
you just take your first best guess. So let's pick three markets. I don't really care what they are. And let's test. What's the only way to know if it's the right market? Ask them. And I'm sure you've thought about this, Jamie, but so many times people come to me and they go, Alan, I've got this idea, but I don't know if it will sell. Do you think it will sell? And I think to myself, well, I can't tell you if it will sell to the public. Like, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know. I have no idea. And even if you look at, say, Dragon's Den or Shark's Tank, they get it wrong 50% of the time. And they're the experts with the millions. They don't know who will buy what. There's only one way to know. And I say to them, there's only one question I can answer with 100% certainty. Do you know what that question is, Jamie? No idea. It is, would I buy? So if you ask me, Alan, would you buy my comic book? I can give you the answer with 100% certainty, but I can't tell you if other people would buy. Yeah, and the answer was yes. <laughs> the answer was yes. I'm waiting for my digital copy and uh, come on, where is it? Uh, yeah, so let's get it. back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so I say to people, like, the only way to know if your niche market is right or not is go and ask a bunch of people. So you're saying, where are these customers? Well, look, we just need to say, I think it's this type of person I'll find five of them on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, email, at a networking event, at a whatever. There's a million ways to find those people. I will find five of them or 10 of them and I'll ask them and I'll go and have a conversation. I'll chat and see what they say. And if they say yes, you're like, boom, I have a customer. Awesome. Let me go find more of that type of person. And as you have seen, there is an endless pool of people online and in real life that you can find about your subject. I love this because it's this one-on-one -on -one connection. And that's something that like, basically that's what got my like Kickstarter funded is reaching out to everyone that I knew in real life, old friends, family members, colleagues, like really reaching out to people one-on-one -on -one. before the Kickstarter. Like we had talked where I was just catching up with them, you know, rekindling these friendships and then when I launched, they were like, oh, God, yeah, I'd love to support you. So I had people who were not even my target market, right, supporting me. So that that's just wonderful for art. But that makes so much sense for all sales, because even if like that person you made a connection with isn't your ideal client, if you like them and they like you, they're going to recommend you to someone else. I see you getting and excited about that. And they know your ideal client. They probably yeah. know some of them. And that's how the word gets out. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think a, a lot of artists are introverts and this is like a huge part of it is like building those connections. And I have to say this actually is really nice to hear and it, it releases a lot of that sales anxiety because I'm still very confused about social media. I know how it works. I know how to post and I know you can read every like social media tutorial, take fucking courses on Udemy. They're all saying the same thing and you can follow all of that, but it's, there's not really a magic formula to get people to follow you on social media. There, you can fight the algorithm and use the right images, but I feel like when it's a human, a one-to-one -one human, I have more control over that relationship than I do with the social media relationship with strangers that don't even know I exist. Yes. And you have no control over the relationship with Facebook algorithm or mm -hmm. Instagram's algorithm. You do what you do. You play the game. But reaching out one-to-one, -one, like that's the only real thing you have control over. That doesn't mean you shouldn't post on social media. It doesn't mean you shouldn't share it because you never know what comes from those connections. But that's outside of your... I have this thing, Jamie, which I do on the courses, which is called locus of control, which is a very fancy way of saying, what are you able to control and what aren't you? And it's surprisingly how many entrepreneurs come to me and they are focused on how they hate the Facebook algorithm and they, they spend their time talking about it. And I ask them, is that within your control or outside your control? And of course, they can't do anything about it. None of us can. Like we can whinge all we want, but they'll do what they do. And what is within your control, you can control sending emails, making calls, reaching out one-to-one. -one. Like Facebook Messenger still, if you reach out one-to-one, -one, they do this thing. If you don't know the person, it goes into a spam box. That's annoying and makes it harder to reach people. But if you are friends with them, like either they get a ping on their phone saying someone's messaged. And then you're like, oh, I can control that. I can connect with that. And it makes it way more. Yeah. You have to spend 80 to 90% of your time focused on what you can control. 
and then indulge yourself for 10% <laughs> chatting about what you can't control in the world. I, I really like the locus of control, I don't know, theory, that sounds a little, or idea, mindset, can you say locus of control mindset? I like that. Yeah, as, as a person who like suffers depression and anxiety a lot, that idea has helped me overcome that, not just in sales, but in life, because when I think, you know, life is outside of me, I can't do anything about it, you know, there's no control, then the anxiety, depression just are overwhelming. But when I say, well, no, actually, like, I have a lot of control over my life, I have a lot of control over those things, you know, it's not all out there. It actually helps me to deal with those problems a bit more. And yeah, by finding the things that I can control in it. And a lot of studies do show people who have the internal locus versus the external are are generally happier. So back to like the social media and the things you can control, you can control social media in a way if you pay for advertising. What do you think about paying for advertising, you know, ads on Facebook? Worth it? Useless? Waste of money? I know you're very big on don't spend any money. So this kind of goes completely against that. So please elaborate, Alan. So we're actually doing a marketing mini experiment for the podcast coming up where Adam from Craft Box Club has got a budget. We did an episode designing on the target market, how it works, the adverts. He's gone away to launch the advert for two weeks and then he's going to come back and see if anyone buys. And it's really interesting. So I think I have several bits here. Number one is when you're starting and bootstrapping, like get your market like sell first, like find the customers, get money coming in before you spend money. Because I think there's such an allure, you know this, you see on Facebook, you see on Instagram, you see all these courses that tell you, if you learn how to use Facebook ads, you'll have an endless stream of hungry customers that want to buy from you and you'll make millions. If you don't know who your target market is, Facebook ads won't work for you. Because good advertising is all about being targeted. If you know, like we had this thing of, is it spooky men or spooky women who are going to buy the comic? You wanted it to be spooky women. It turns out they didn't. Uh, maybe a few of them. You know <laughs> what I mean. A few of them. A few of them. Yeah. But if we chucked a bunch of money into spooky women advertising, like we would have wasted our dollars because we'd be advertising to a product to a bunch of people who like one in a hundred or one in a thousand would buy. Whereas if we did that same budget to spooky men, you might have had 10 in a thousand by it or more. And I think what I would suggest to everyone listening is you need to do the experiments to know your target market before you pump money into making it going faster. And spending money will speed things up and you will either speed up the demise of your business <laughs> by spending money that doesn't take you anywhere, or you will speed up the success of your business. It's a bit like pouring gasoline on a fire. What I want people to do is spend their time like rubbing the sticks together, working out how it works and make the fire work. Once the fire is working, you can pour some gasoline on it and it'll go crazy. But if you haven't even got the fire working, like the gasoline won't do anything. It won't make things go quicker. Actually, you're just throwing away resources. Mm. So when you see about it like that, I mean, like for your second comic... I'd be saying, let's do some experiments, Jamie. But like we've got some profit from the first one. Not that much, but we have some profit. Let's take a few hundred bucks and experiment with three target markets and work out which one and do some advertising. And we'll have some fun doing that. I'm excited for the next season of the coaching oh, yeah. series where we do your next comic book what? or whatever it is. Yeah, well, definitely. I mean, I got to put out another comic book now. This is my life. This is who I am now. <laughs> got to keep it rolling. <laughs> Super excited. Jamie Dillon, comic book author. That's my dream. Yeah, thank you. I guess it's true now. I've had it my is first true. Comic. It is true. It's done. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome. You know, just like now that you've kind of come back to my comic and my art, I wanted to share this one thing. I had heard, you had said this to me at some point, you know, a lot of businesses have a feast or, or famine. And the reason they have that feast or famine is because when they're doing the work, they should also be selling. And this is totally true in art. Like a lot of people will make a bunch of paintings and have an art show and then make a bunch of and And they wonder why they're not selling anything. It's because they weren't building those relationships during the time. I don't know what you think the ratio is, but I've heard it's like 50-50. Then on some free webinar I, I watched a while ago, the uh, host said, no, an art business is 90% marketing and 10% art making. Now, as the person making the art, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I mean, do like an 80-20? 
But I found that really fascinating because I can say after my Kickstarter, the majority of the work was marketing. And now, you know, you and I had decided I'm going to work on my newsletter and I'm working on it not at the rate that I hoped because now I'm in the art making part and I'm using all my time for that. So I'm like, fuck, how do I maintain marketing while I'm doing the actual making of the product? Like, how do you keep these two balanced? Do you think it's an 80-20 do you think it's 50-50? Like, how do you see the sales and the actual product creation working together? So I actually see it as a slightly more nuanced answer that changes over time. So I think, number one, for you personally, for anyone doing this as a side hustle, you've got a full-time job that takes your chunk of time. If you went full-time on the comic books, you have a lot more to be able to split across those two things, and you'll find a more balance doing that. I think it changes over the time. And when you first start your art business, you don't have any customers. Like 90% of your time is finding customers. Then you're delivering, but you're still finding new customers. But the thing that has built after that first bit is you've started to build your mailing list. You've started to build your fan base. So for the second product, like to go back to the 172 backers you've got, how easy is it now, Jamie? Yeah, I can just reach out to them any anytime I want. So you've built a base of people who love your art that probably would be interested in the second comic book. So you you spend less time on the second one, or actually maybe you spend the same time, but now you've got 500 backers. And then the fourth one, you spend the same time, maybe you get a thousand backers. And after a while, maybe the fifth comic book, you've got such a base that you don't have to market as much. People start coming to you, the word starts spreading, but you have to do the work in the beginning to bring it in. And then all of a sudden, like it builds its own momentum, it starts to grow. So I guess imagine it as building a snowball. To start with, you have to pick up the snow and compact it. You have to start pushing it and start pushing it and it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets bigger. And then after a while, it will just like take off down the hill. But most people never put enough energy in at the start to get it to take off because it's a huge amount of energy. So there is a point like after maybe comic book five, six, seven, I don't know. We'll find out when it is, if we keep this going together, Um, we'll find out where that is, where it starts to build and it changes and you'll be able to spend more time doing your art. You'll also have more financial resources to get people to help you with this stuff. So if your comic book business takes off and you're making 10,000, 20,000 a month, well, we can hire someone to help you do your Instagram. We can hire someone to do it. But to start with, you've got to put the energy in. You've got to connect with the customers. And it's those early days of connecting. They will become your super fans that spread the word and grow and create that energy in the future. Does that make sense? So I'm very reticent to give you a number other than at the start, 90, and then it goes down over the period. And I totally get that. So then back to just how do you balance you know, not just for, I mean, obviously I'm an artist and, and I appreciate your answer, you know, personally, but I feel like most of your, <laughs> most of your audience probably is an artist. So how would you, you know, just come back to that, just balancing. Yeah. Okay. Let's say, I think maybe I'm going to just assume a lot of your audience is side hustlers as well with, with day jobs, trying to transition to a full-time business. So how do you manage the business side of like developing your product or your service and delivering it with marketing and getting new clients like how do you manage both of these it's a great question how do you manage them i have some tips and tools number one is the business side of things so doing the books controlling the numbers all of that stuff does need to happen you need to organize it you're going to have to pay tax all of that stuff i would ask for help like your partner your friend can you help me for an hour at the weekend get my books in order like deal with this deal with that and What I found is when it's a task that one has to do, it can be easily put off and it becomes this thing I don't want to do. But when you commit to a time and say, I'll do it with you, which I think is part of the power of this podcast, Jamie, is like people commit to doing things with me. Alan, (laughs) I, I would never have done my Kickstarter if I hadn't come on this podcast. Never, 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 never. Well, I can't say never but I would have put it off until I was ready. And because like I had this accountability partner, I just did it. And man, best thing I ever did. Best thing I ever did. You'll never be ready. 
no one's ever ready. You just kind of dive in. You're exactly right. So I think number one, I'd ask your friends, I'd make it more fun. Number two, you could ask a different business owner if you've created a little group of people you know, is say, can we spend an hour on mine and an hour on yours? I think finding that balance of doing a bit of it as you go along. I think what I did in the early days was wrong and I wouldn't file any receipts until the end of the quarter. And then I'd have this mountain of receipts to type into an Excel spreadsheet that caused me so much pain. It would end up being six months and then I could never remember, like, what is this? What am I doing? I feel kind of personally called out right now here, Alan. Just No, this is me. <laughs> this yeah, is exactly, this is probably all of us. Now, like, literally, we went for the cafe this morning and I track my spending. So in my phone, I pulled out my phone. I typed in the numbers and boom, I've done it. It takes me like, I don't know, 14 seconds, 15 seconds in the moment. And then I don't have the headache that takes me a day and a half at the end of the quarter. And I think it's just like, we just need to get used to the processes and the systems of the bit and making sure that small daily tasks happen rather than building up until the end. And if we do that, it feels a lot more balanced. I love that because I find like, in the self-help world, like uh, habits, habit forming is very big right now. I think it's from that, uh, there's that one. James Clear, Atomic James Clear, yeah. Habits. He yeah. is amazing. Mm-hmm. But there was even one before that, like many years ago, but that one is a, is a very good book. And I, as you were talking about, fi- you know, putting receipts in your phone immediately, I was thinking, I track all of my food. I track it all. That's a, I've, I've been doing it for years. Wow. And uh, except occasionally on weekends, I don't. So don't tell anyone, though. <laughs> Secret between you and me. Sometimes weekends don't count. Oh. Um, but, you know, like five days of a week, I know exactly what I'm going to eat. I meal prep and I put, in, I put in my food already today. And I don't even think about it. I just mm-hmm. do it. It actually, it's fun to me. It's like a game. And when I think about tracking my expenses every day, I get a pang of anxiety. Ah, money. Ah. And it's not like I don't have like money in my bank account or something. It's just, I don't know. Like that has become anxiety for me. Oh, it's, we can just have a therapy session now. I know a big part of it is like, because my parents are bad with money and we never talked about money and my parents are like low income. So for me, talk about money and think about money. It's very stressful. So although like my parents didn't count calories or anything, like we weren't a healthy family. (laughs) So I don't know why I went this way, but that means that I can fight against my upbringing. So I can get over this like money anxiety and I, and I will. And, And I think we should in all business things, make it a habit. Like when I was in the middle of the Kickstarter every morning, I journal, and then I would do marketing for like a half hour and just contact people, just contact it's a people habit. on my list. Yeah, just made it a habit. Exactly. And you make it a fun game. Like if you can yes. make this stuff fun and a habit, suddenly you're like, oh, I get to do this. And it produces a chart and it moves me towards my goals. Or mm-hmm. like I get to send three messages to people and I can have fun and be a bit cheeky. And yeah. like if you can turn it into a fun game, and I think this is why... Simon and I speak so much about pick a business you enjoy doing. Not all of it's going to be fun, but you can turn most of it into fun. But if you don't pick a business you enjoy, you're not going to want to do the stuff. Like you get to do art. You get to make money drawing, Jamie. Like you get to make money putting your comic book into the world. Like how cool is that? It's super cool. that's cool. And then like, if you don't do that, let's say, um, I don't know, whatever it is your subject, that's a demon for you, but you had to write spreadsheets every day with finance equations. You'd probably go, I'm not that excited. I don't know if I can get up for that. Yeah, true. You know, it's funny. Um, I know you've changed your, your uh, show intro to a cool rebel <laughs> business school. Uh, I've had so many it, problems with the intro. No yeah. one seems to like any of the intros I do. Well, the other one, yeah, I didn't like the American voice intro, but there was one part in it where you were like, I'm not going to do it if it's not fun, something like that. <laughs> uh, and and I and I would hear it as I'm walking, I'm listening to it, I'm like, yeah, that really got me because I was like, it's true. I just, I want to have fun. Like, I don't want my business to be a chore. I don't, I, I want to do it the rest of my life. I don't want to be miserable at the thing that I chose to do. You know, it's enough. We have day jobs that we don't like trying to escape. It's like, the business should be fun if this is a thing you're going to do most of the time. So yeah, I like this game thing. I'm also like, 
everyone can hear about my mental health issues. So I'm listening to the audiobook of um, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living. P.S. This book is oh, super hilarious. Dale Carnegie. Yeah, Carnegie. It's it's actually, so it's it has very, very, very good tips, but it's written in like old timey times, right? It's written so in the e- 30s, I think, maybe the 40s. So every man is like a farmer, a business owner, a door-to-door salesman, and every woman is like a housewife. A secretary, a stenographer, you know, it's like, okay, fail. Thanks. Like, but so if you could take that with a grain of salt, one of them was talking about like having a stressful job. It was literally the chapter I just listened to. And he was talking about making it a game. And of course I say stenographer because that was the one he was talking about this woman who, you know, seen how many receipts she could put in an hour and she could double it up. And it was like super sexist, but it doesn't matter. It was actually true. And I kind of took that with me to work this week because my job is not bad, but I was getting stressed out. And I'm like, okay, you know what? Like, how about you just change your mindset and say, like, my job's not stressful. My job is super fun and exciting. And all these skills that I'm learning here, I'm going to be able to take back to my business. Now I can deal with stress. And now I know more about design. And I'm actually doing marketing at my job, which I, you know, can use for my own stuff and back and forth. So yeah, I think like finding a way to make it a game is the best. I mean, that's why I work out all, all the time. Like, it's fun. I enjoy it. I found the thing that I like to do. I like lifting up heavy things and putting them down again. <laughs> And then every week I track the numbers, you know, I track all my, my weight. Did I go up in, in weight this week? You know, did I not? How much do I have? To? So yeah, it, it became fun for me. So we have the tracking, we have the games and like, yeah. So if I can just take my fitness world into the sales, perfect. Well, I think there's several things I'd like to say here. The first is what is fun for you, Jamie, is different to what is fun for me and different to other people. And actually, this is the variety of life, which when I say to people, start a business you find fun, like find something that's fun and do that, that will actually make you stand out because it's not fun for other people. I like creating PowerPoints. Like, I love that. Open me up PowerPoint with some images. Give me a few hours. I'll get lost and I love it. Most people think you're weird, Alan. I don't enjoy doing that. This is very strange. And that's the variety of life is like I can make money doing PowerPoints and they can make money doing yeah. something else. I love making PowerPoints. Like, so I'm with, I'm with you on that one. I love a good PowerPoint. I love that. Mm. <laughs> I found a fellow PowerPoint oh, lover. Yeah. Excellent. There's not many of us. Well, I've worked in e-learning for like a decade before. Now I'm in video games and like 90% of what I did was in PowerPoint. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, The second thought is there is a way to make it fun. And I was listening to this Tony Robbins thing a while back and he inspired me and said, how can you make these things fun? And I was wanting to make sales calls at that point. And it was in the summer in England. It was reasonably hot for England. It was sunny. It was blue skies. So I actually like got up early, went into the garage and put up the like little gazebo thing in the garden, made myself a giant picture of orange squash with ice and sat in the garden and made my calls. And when I ring people and I say, hi, how are you? And they're like, good, how are you? I'm like, I'm really good. I'm in the garden. I've got a cold drink. I'm having fun. And they would connect with me. It's very strange, but they would connect with me. And by making it fun for me, it made it fun for them. And I was more likely to have good calls by doing it that way. It ended up in more appointments, more leads, because I was enjoying it, they enjoyed it. So I think that's my second thought is, even if it's something you don't want to do, like there's a way to make it fun. Yeah. I also like, you know, even if it didn't make it fun, let's say, I think you want to associate that task that you don't like with something that you do like. So for example, my therapist says, what's a drink that I really like and that I should have that drink with me when we're having our session so that we can sort of just set this tone that this is a really nice thing. So the fact that you, you know, even if you didn't like it, if you knew that every time you had to do sales, you got to sit in your gazebo with birds and a lovely drink, like you wouldn't mind, you know, like imagine that was the only time you had like fizzy drinks or something like that. And, you know, all right, I get to have this because I'm doing the the sales at the same time. So I I really like that. And the third thought I'd love to give you actually comes from a study they did about why people would change suppliers. And this was business to business, but the principle is really interesting. Why do you think, Jamie, people would change from supplier A to supplier B? What do you think the reasons are? It's cheaper. Yep. So one was definitely price. I would say maybe like easier to get closer to home. I don't know. And I would also say maybe they were nicer. Uh, So the like main three that you probably knew were coming out were price, quality, and service. Like price of the product, quality of the product, and customer service, which is kind of like the niceness bit. 
But there was one very interesting one which they weren't expecting. No one was expecting this result from this particular study. And 71% of these businesses would change supplier if the new supplier was more fun. Ooh. And if you think about it, let's say you had two people who would supply you an identical product for an identical price, and one of them was just fun to be around, which one would you buy from? Yeah, fun, for sure. Who wants a big, boring old whatever? Yeah, love it. And sometimes you'll even pay more just to do business with the fun person. I know that. Like, there's certain airlines that I hate flying with. And I will pay more to avoid them because the experience is just <laughs> hideous, turns me into a horrible person. So I actually will spend more to have a nicer experience and more fun. And it's, it's fascinating. I mean, it is really fascinating when you look at how big of an impact this plays on people's purchasing decisions, where they spend their time, their life, all of those elements. I love it. So I kind of had this other question. I'm going to throw this one out like from left field. I'm not going to follow the, the the train of thought we were going on. And it's just sort of like, where did you learn sales? I see your eyes there, uh, Ellen. Where did you learn sales? I think anyone who's listened to the podcast knows about like your history, your dad and, and everything like that. And do you think that you learned from him? Do you think you learned trial in it? Like, cause you've, you've had the sale experience from a younger age. And I'm asking this because I want to know like, can people learn it? Is it a skill that can be learned? Do you think some people are born with this ability to sell? Let's take that sort of idea. Where, where did you learn to sell? Was it progress over time, trial and error? And can others learn it? Or did I pop out of the womb going, hello, doctor, nurse, I've got a special offer for you <laughs> today, 1999, Alan Donegan's cord. No, but I, did, I didn't pop kind out of the I womb. what I imagined, actually. <laughs> Like I was the shyest kid you could ever meet when I was younger, Jamie. I couldn't talk to strangers. I remember going, I love Chinese food. My parents took me to a Chinese restaurant. There was a piano player there. And they said, here's like a tip. Go and ask them for a song. And they told me what to ask for. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. My parents pushed me to do it. I burst into tears. I hated it. I couldn't talk to strangers. When I got to my college years, so college in England is 16 to 18. It's not university. University happens afterwards. So when I got to 16 to 18 at school, my dad had run out of money. And he said to me, I cannot give you pocket money. I cannot help you pay for your transport, but I can give you the opportunity to earn. You can have anything from my sportswear store at cost and sell it to your friends and make a profit. And he would help me with a list of T-shirts and shorts. So I took some into school and said, would you like to buy this? Would you like to buy this? I sold a few and actually quite liked it because there was a bunch of people who liked what I had to offer. And I started making money and I was like, this is cool. I'm giving them something they want. I'm getting something I want. And it was great. So I think that helped. And I had a very negative experience when I went to my dad's work and someone rung up and I think my dad recognized his voice and he like put him on hold and then said, you speak to him, Alan. So I spoke to him and he was inquiring about some products. And after a while he said, are you Donegan? I'm like, yes, I'm Alan Donegan. And he said, you related to Kevin. And then he like got really angry, swore at me, slammed the phone down. And I think him and my dad, my dad at times like rubbed people the wrong way. He'd had an argument with my dad or something, but I got that stick and I think that instance put me off using the phone. And I, I like the pain of having to make my own sales calls when I launched my own business, Jamie. I hated it. I struggled. I cried. I couldn't do it. Oh, my God. You just had this insane trauma of like early sales. How did you get over it? <laughs> How did I get over it? Like it was not easy. Um, I remember I had a mentor who said the only way to sell training courses is by phone. And I was like, I can't do phone calls. And he said, come into the office, do them with me. So I went into his office. He was so generous. His name was Ed. So generous. He helped me feel calm. I sat there and made calls. I made a hundred calls in the morning and one of them answered and I had a reasonable conversation. And then at lunch, I was reviewing it with this guy, Ed. And he said, oh, okay, so you got this lead. You said this. He said he was interested why didn't you close for an appointment? I was like, because he said he wasn't ready. Yeah, but that was your chance. That was your chance. 
And I remember falling to pieces under cross-examination. I spent the whole morning in my one opportunity, I'd let him off the hook. That's that view of sales being pushy. Mm -hmm. And I went outside and he told me the only way I could sell was by phone. And I broke down because I couldn't do it. And I was ripped in part inside because I want to build a business. I need to do my own thing, but I can't do this. And I burst into tears. I remember ringing Katie and going, I can't do this in tears, falling to pieces. I couldn't even go back inside his office and face Ed again. And I got in my car and drove away and fell to pieces. And I was a mess. Like this stuff really ripped me in two. How did I overcome it? I read a book called Cold Calling for Chickens, which changed my perspective and helped me to feel more comfortable. The realization that sales is not about being pushy. It's about finding people who need what you've got. The realization it's about connecting, the realization about every time I sell, I help people, all these realizations. But it was study. It was going on courses. It was reading books. It was studying sales. And I think your question of are you born like being able to do this, I was not. I was not born being able to do this. Everything I've learned is crafted from books and courses and audio Back in the day, CDs. I don't know if you remember those things. You're old enough, cassette tapes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. I am very aware. Yeah, all the young people are going, what's a CD? You know, that stuff you listen to uh, before iPods and iPhones were a thing. It's all crafted. It's all learnt. And it's learnt thoughts. It's learnt behaviours. It's learnt beliefs. They're the tough ones to change the beliefs, but they can mm -hmm. be changed. And then you start to develop those skills and feel more comfortable. And now... I still get a pang of nerves if I've had to make a completely cold call, but I get on with it and I have fun when I do it. But it's all learned, Jamie. And I think anyone who's thinking, I can't do this sales stuff, Alan, that's just where you are now. You can change that if you wish. Thank you for sharing this story, Alan. It's really powerful because you are like, you know, pop-up business school. Like you literally teach, you teach all this and you came from a place where you had like, so basically like you're going to have a panic attack if you had to do more sales. You can even walk back in after and you felt so ashamed. You felt it was over. You felt it was not for you. You literally felt it was not for you. And you could have actually quit. And instead of quitting, you said, I'm going to keep learning. You got this book. You did research. You did courses. You kept going. You kept going at it. And I love that. I think that's amazing. I think like not just for sales, but anyone who, you know, started a business and it's something they love, but they're not good at it. Who fucking cares? Just keep going. Most things are learned. No one's born, yeah, like out of the womb selling stuff, you know? And if they are, ooh, well, that's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite example of that was stand-up comedy. I did stand-up comedy a couple of times. I spent some time learning it. And when I realized that joke writing was a formula, and if you learn the formula, put your own creativity into it, anyone can learn how to write a joke. And I used to run this course with Microsoft where I would take some of their most technical people and teach them how to write jokes to prove them then they could learn anything. <laughs> this stuff became addictive because I was like, I can learn anything, like anything. I don't care what it is. I don't care what you need to learn. You can learn it. And I got addicted, Jamie. I went on every course. I read every book. I got fascinated with learning. I did do the second bit, which lots of people don't, which is I would learn and apply. So I'd learn a joke writing technique and then I'd use it and do it and see if anyone laughed. Sometimes they would, sometimes they wouldn't, and I would learn again. But yeah, I became religious with my learning and implementation. I love it. I also like that you you did say, because I was going to call you on it, uh, <laughs> implementing, because I love courses and you can get addicted to taking and buying, you know, registering, doing all these courses watching YouTube videos, tutorials, and all this stuff, and then never implementing a thing. So what's the best advice you would give someone who loves courses, loves to learn, but isn't implementing stuff? So uh, I have a term for these people, me included, for a while, which was called self-development junkies. And it's meant with uh, absolute respect, <laughs> um, because I was, and I love it. It's incredible, the buzz of learning, the buzz of doing these things. What I would say to you is you need to sit down after every time you learn something, every chapter of a book, every course you go on and go, what am I actually going to do based on this? And there was something Tony Robbins said to me, which was never leave the scene of a decision without taking action. So if you sit down and like go, okay, here's the three things I'm going to do based on this course. 
you're not allowed to leave the cafe. You're not allowed to leave the desk until you've done something about it. Send an email, make a phone call, whatever it is. It doesn't matter how small the action is, but taking that action. And I think that's what really changes things. So when Katie and I went on our first financial independence event and we were learning about that, we made notes, we decided what to do, we took action and then like literally did it the next day and it was done and we were on our way to doing it. And yeah, like never leave the scene of a decision until you've taken an action. Love this. Should get that on the t-shirt. <laughs> I do feel like I need a Rebel Entrepreneur t-shirt one day. Oh um, God, yeah, I'm surprised you don't have. Even just for me. <laughs> yeah. I, another reason I I fell for your podcast, I was like, Rebel Business. I'm a rebel. <laughs> so it's a good name. <laughs> I'm, I got tattoos and piercings. That sounds like my kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm probably the least like rebellious. I have no tattoos. I have no piercings. Like I'm just rebellious in the way I do things. I don't listen to societal norms. I decide whether it's right or wrong for me. Obviously, there are some societal norms that I follow, like don't oh, murder yeah. people. That's a very good one. I love that one. Big fan of that. Be <laughs> yeah, nice too. to people, like big fan of that one. But yeah, just because someone says you have to do something a certain way doesn't mean you have. Like work out what's the best way for you and then make that thing happen. Yeah, that's great. I feel like that's a great like thought to end on. Like, yes. We've talked about sales. Is there a way, is there a, a system for sales? Not so much, right? Like it's not this amorphic thing, but you do have to do a lot of trial and error. So there's that side. And then it's like, well, target clients, target market. Where do we find them? How do we do them? Well, you start reaching out to the people you know, like you make connections. So it's not so structured as we think. And then, you know, when you get to the end of it, you've, you've done all the sales, you've done learning, you know, this, like you just, you, you, I, I just lost my thought. You've had to finish. I I lost it. I was trying to close up and I and I lost the last thing you said. I go oh, trial and error. There we go. You can leave all that in. You can leave it in. I don't care. <laughs> trial and error. You just keep trying. And it does work. Just like this. Just like you fuck up on a podcast and you forget your words. Then you just try it again and you get it. And the answer is trial and error. Do you have any final thoughts, Alan, that you'd like to share? My final thought is it's about learning and implementing, which is very similar to trial and error read the book on sales, listen to this podcast episode and take one of the things and go, I'm going to go and speak to people, listen to our series about sales and go, okay, I'm going to try target marketing. I'm going to try that. Take what we discuss on the podcast and do something because the only way you really get the knowledge and experience is by implementing. So I'm going to speak for the both of us, Jamie, get out there, take action and do it. That is how you build an extraordinary life. I love it. Thank you very much, Alan. That was a great conversation. Thank you for letting me on my podcast. Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> and that was the first episode in the Rebel Entrepreneur Takeover series. Jamie got to do the introduction. She got to say to Andrew, the editor, Andrew, play me my cheeky jingle, which for those of you being on the show know that I say that every single time. And we had a huge amount of fun talking about sales. And if you would like the opportunity to take over the Rebel Entrepreneur podcast and grill me, then you can do that. All you need to do is go to the page at alandonagan.com forward slash podcast. Fill out the little form on there that says you'd like to take over the podcast. Tell us why. Tell us what you'd like to grill me about. And then Patrick, the podcast manager, will get in touch and have a chat to you. So if you'd like to take over The Rebel Entrepreneur, we are at your disposal. You can have any life you want to. Choose to build something cool. Choose to take action. Choose to work to make your dreams become reality. Stand out. Be different. Be yourself. Be a Rebel Entrepreneur.